Hey, man, first, I just want to thank you for taking some time out of your very, very, uh, you know, busy schedule to sit down and uh, really just talk with me about everything that's happening now in the world. We got a lot going on, man. Um, okay. Not only is there unrest out there due to uh, what happened with uh, um, George, what is it, Lloyd, right? Uh, yeah, Lloyd. Floyd. Is it Floyd? Floyd? With the F. Yeah. yeah. Floyd with the F, George Floyd, and... Uh, We'll, we'll get into all that because as stuff is happening, a lot is changing and it's and it's pretty crazy. We'll talk about um, this upcoming election, how some of these things might tie into that and some things that have, uh, you know, have happened uh, prior to this. But let's start there, man. Uh, let's start, start with George Floyd, um, originally a native of Houston, Texas, um, attached to hip hop, um, and was actually uh, a, a rapper um, down that way, who was uh, who was affiliated with? Uh, I don't want to say it was Suave House, but actually, uh, you know, some notable cats down in that area uh, during the period of time. I'm also um, very close with former NBA uh, ball player Stephen Jackson and podcaster now Stephen Jackson, uh, even referring to him as brothers, his twins, uh, or his twin. And uh, from what we know, he was pulled over. Uh, the Minnesota, the, uh, the, the Minis, Minneapolis, I guess, police department is saying that he resisted re arrest. We have a video that contradicts that. There was no resistance. Um, and then nine minutes later, this man happens to lose his life uh, due to what appears to be a chest uh, on the, or I'm sorry, a knee to the back of his neck. Uh, not one, but now we know three officers uh, stood on uh, or, or knelt on him or, or however they're trying to soften uh, putting a knee on somebody in a, in, in a manner. I've, 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 I've seen kneels, I've seen uh, knelt, I've seen all types of nice words to describe uh, putting your knee to the back of someone's neck. So um, I'll start with you, uh, let you introduce yourself. So you've been on the show before, um, talking about, you know, Kanye to, you know, politically what was going on at the time, but I'll let you introduce yourself and then go in and, 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 and you can kind of give me some info on, on our just your take on the situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Michael Morris, um, uh, an attorney, prosecutor, LA County. I'm also a adjunct law professor um, focusing in the area of criminal law, criminal sentencing and procedural st uh, type stuff. Uh, obviously, I've known you seems like forever now. We must yeah. be coming up 15, 20 yeah. at this point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we used to do music together. I'm still one of the illest lyricists. That's probably the, that's the, that, I want that at the top of the resume. <laughs> I'll make sure in the caption I'll put, I sat down with one of the illest. Yeah, yeah. I won't say illest lyricist, but I think full package wise, I was up there. Um, you, were, you, were but the Drake, you were the Drake of the independent scene is what you're, is what you're saying, except no one wrote rhymes for you. I was a harder edge, way harder edge, Drake. I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't crying like- acting career. Yeah, I, I'm a Drake fan, as you know, but it, that's, you know, we digress. That's another yes. show. That's another show. Um, so yeah, that's my background then. I mean, and I should say, you know, as an attorney, I should give a disclaimer, the views expressed by me in this setting aren't that of any, either of my employers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that's my background. You know, it's interesting. Um, looking at these issues um, because I, f I feel like I'm coming at it from sort of three perspectives. Number one is that as a young black male who grew up in a community that was pretty vigilantly enforced uh, by law enforcement, had its share of gang activity as well, you know, you name it. Coming from that sort of background to now working with law enforcement closely and also still having an academic interest in everything that's occurring from like a big picture standpoint. Right. Um, so it's kind of a three sort of prong or three sort of dimensional look that I, I kind of like to think about these issues. And, you know, from the academic standpoint, from a law enforcement standpoint, because that's that's the that's the that's the, the role that I'm in right now. That's my job. Um, mm -hmm. And all, but also like, you know, coming from where I came from and being who I am. And that's so it's, it's all those three, three yeah. worlds together. So let me ask you that, because that's a that's a great segue. Um, you looking at that and having to, you know, experiencing being on the other side of the law, um, or not so much 
as if you were ever were in trouble, but as far as being suspected uh, of, of doing something and now being in a situation where you essentially have the fate of someone in your hands, even though a judge or however a district attorney makes that final decision, but you are there acting on their best interest. And then also someone who's sitting back and I don't want to say is a fan of 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 law, but someone who's very interested in everything that encompasses that. So how do you look at that? How do you sit down in a situation like this? And how does that resonate or, or how does that make you feel when you see these type of things? Man, it's 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 so many different things at the same time, you know. Um, I I people like George Floyd um, are people that I grew up with. You know, I see myself in in, in that person, in a Trayvon Martin or or in a um, Aubrey, um, you know. And but at the, over the past you know six seven years now, I also see it from the law enforcement perspective a little bit too, you know. And so. Um, it puts me in an interesting position. It is, it, there's always mixed feelings when something like this happens. Um, but I do feel fortunate that I kind of have both of those perspectives. And I think it gives me sort of the ability to sort of, uh, you know, try to see it in a balanced way as best you can. Everybody has their biases, you know, nobody's person perfect or has the, the, the silver bullet to any of this stuff. Right. But, uh, but I, I, do, I do think it brings me some degree of clarity, at least in my mind. Right. So let's talk about first, I guess, just the happenings of, of what happened. So you've seen the video from your professional opinion and from what you know about, um, you know, the law. Yeah. This went left really quick. I mean, unless there's some information that we don't have yet, this just looked like your officers who were really just out to really do some harm to somebody that day. Yeah, you know, I gotta confess, I, I haven't, I haven't seen every single angle that's out there. Neither have um, I. I've seen but two. yeah, but I will say that to me, the relevant point it doesn't even people. And I've had people ask me, what was he being arrested for, or what was the allegation? And this is one of those situations where it doesn't even matter. Like I, I, I don't care that what the relevant portion of the video or videos is the portion where he's completely subdued mm -hmm. uh, by multiple law enforcement officers, meaning that he is no threat to them. And there is one of them with his, you know, knee on the back of, of this guy's neck. And he's basically narrating his own death. Yeah. He's asking to, to be, to be uh, you know, this guy to get off his neck. He starts saying, I'm dying. He starts calling for his mother, yeah. you know, which is, you know, that, that act of calling for your mother. I mean, if you look back into like, you know, battlefields from World War II and Vietnam, like that's, that is a sort of historically significant thing. And there are soldiers who were left on the battlefield alone who were calling for their mother. It's like a primal call, you right, know, yeah. somebody who's in deep, deep distress. That final um, call almost. You yeah. Know? Yeah. The, and it seemed as though, you know, there's a humiliation factor to that, you know, that was almost, it's almost like it was sought. Um, yeah. And then you have the bystanders who were trying to be the voice of reason, so to speak, in pleading with the officers or trying to get them to, you know, release him. And then obviously you have the, the multiple officers who didn't step in and do anything at all. Mm -hmm. So to my mind, it doesn't even matter what happened before that. Um, he could have been charging those officers with a knife, quite frankly. Like once he's subdued and he's handcuffed, which he was, and he's no threat to anyone, there's no reason to be applying force, especially for that length of time. Right. So to my mind, it's a clear, unjustified killing, and it's a murder um, right. and, and the, the law. That, that, that's a murder. When you apply force, even if you're not meaning to kill someone, when you apply such force or you act in such a way that demonstrates a conscious disregard or a lack of regard for human life, that is being charged with murder. It's sort of like, um, if you were to drink, you know, take 10 shots of whatever you take, and let's say that's enough for you to be completely blasted, you jump on the freeway and you drive the opposite side, on the opposite side of the road, you know, like you're not intending to kill anyone, but you're acting with such a disregard that you would be charged with murder. And that's the theory under which they eventually charged him with. They charged him with their equivalent, which is third degree murder, I guess. Third degree, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
which in California would be second degree murder. Second degree murder. So do you think that they gave him that type of sentence or not sentence, but they charged him with that and then it took them what? two or three days to bring him in. Is that solely because he was a police officer, you feel? Only, and even with the video and even with different folks saying, hey, this clearly appears to be a murder, they still gave him a couple days for whatever reason, even to even to bring the charges. Right, and I wanna say, yeah, the reason why they, they did not charge him in the way that they normally would and they being, you know, the Minnesota office, the DA's office or the county attorney's office is what they call them out there mm -hmm. is because he's a police officer. But um, this is one of those rare cases where, you know, I, I don't, I'm not on social media right now, but, you know, people send me screenshots and stuff like that in, in sort of this community um, in terms of the law enforcement community, you may call right. it, which is, I mean, I'm talking about DA's and, and yeah. cops and stuff like that. And, Usually those are the more cautious, but something like this happens you'll, from what you'll hear from that community is, well, let's wait till the facts come out. You know, you never know, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like I, I heard a lot of DAs, my colleagues sounding off on social media, even some people at high levels in the uh, LA County Sheriff's Department on their personal social media, mm -hmm. sounding off about how this isn't right and charges should be filed. That's rare. I've never seen that happen before. Yeah. And um, that tells us all that, you know, the 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 prosecutor the prosecutor's office in, in that particular county completely dropped the ball. Right. Um, and that's not even that 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 phrase doesn't even capture what they did. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's very gross. They, uh, yeah. So yes, they did it because he was a police officer, but like even that, I mean there's there's more uh, filing a charge against a police officer, there's, there's just more that goes into it than a regular person, so to speak. So there is more caution usually, but that was just, I mean, it's on tape. Like what is, what's the investigation you're doing? Are you watching this thing on loop? Like, is that your investigation? Like what, what else do you need to see? I mean, there will be more things that come out and there are more things that have come out. You just kind of informed me of something before we, we jumped on the show. Right. right. And so there's, there's going to be more that comes out. That's going to be some of it more damning or less damning. Right. But let's, let's we have what, about, what we need. Let's talk about that hypothetically from a prosecutor stance. So I'm sure that whoever's prosecuting this, I don't even know if they've even assigned anyone yet. Don't know how that works. If they can prosecute you without saying, Hey, this is going to be the person who will be prosecuting you in court. We're going to charge you but we haven't assigned a prosecutor yet. But let's say that you ended up having to take on this case and you were the person that was going to be the prosecutor. It appeared you, you might have had a slam dunk evidence wise with, you know, obviously him kneeing uh, uh, Mr. Floyd led to his death. But now the uh, county of, of Minnesota, whoever did the autopsy, just probably within the last half hour said that no, he didn't die from uh, strangulation or uh, asphyxiation. What he died from was a heart condition, something that he already had. This was a pre-existing condition. Now they haven't expounded on that. They haven't given any uh, additional information, but this is what the autopsy says. And so how is that now going to play in um, whether or not they continue to go with the charges or how this looks in, in court when it, when it has to, you know, pretty much be defended. Yeah, so I mean, there's a concept in the law that's called um, eggshell plaintiff, and it's referring to a civil case, but the concept, it applies to criminal as well. It basically is this general principle that you take your victims as you find them. Hmm. Um, that is, let's say for example, you're a burglar, you break into someone's house, you're creeping around their house, grandma wakes up, she sees you, she has a heart attack, boom she falls over and dies, right? Now, a number of things contributed to her death, maybe her advanced age, maybe she had a pre-existing heart condition that made her more susceptible to having going into a state of cardiac arrest on that type of shocking event, right? But the fact remains that, but for you breaking into that house and acting in such an outrageous and way that shows in and of itself a disregard for safety, that person wouldn't be dead. Mm. And so even if it's the case that you know, like, let's say you or I wouldn't have passed away under those circumstances. Maybe we would have had incredible amounts of bruising and maybe we would have passed out but survived or what have you. 
just because he had a pre-existing heart condition that caused him in particular to unfortunately pass away doesn't mean that his death was not caused by um, this act. In other words, but for that act, he'd be alive today. And that's the analysis when you're talking about some, and as far as the law is concerned, when you're talking about someone with a pre-existing condition and their demise is sort of put, the ball is put into motion by some outrageous and reckless and criminal act. Like you're, you don't get a discount because the person who died happened to have a pre-existing condition right, you, right. You as the vendor, right? You know, there's no investigation into the, their health when you shoot them, you know? Like, well, you shoot somebody and they die, right? Some yeah. people will die, some people won't, right? But we don't say, oh, I don't know. Like, he died from the shot in the leg, but he had diabetes. So if he didn't have, we yeah, don't go into die that. in two weeks you anyway. The trigger. Right. Yeah, exactly. You right. pulled the trigger. I um, mean, in, in this case, it's cop culture. Now, that's not, a, that's not to say that there will be argument. The defense is going to seize on that. They're going to say, hey, look, he had a pre-existing condition such that any re a reasonable person wouldn't have known of this pre-existing condition and a reasonable officer is acting under the assumption that this person is a generally healthy person. But I don't think that's going to cut it at the end of the day. And yeah. not only that, it would be interesting to take a look at that autopsy report because as it relates to autopsy reports, I've, I've dealt with a few homicide cases and there's this thing called the manner of death and the cause of death, right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody gets shot, for example, the cause of death is going to be homicide. Right. But the manner of death is going to be a gunshot wound, yeah. right? So it may very well be that he had cardiac, he went into a state of cardiac arrest and he, and that the pre existing condition may have been somewhat a cause of that, but the cause could still be homicide. So it's going to be interesting to see what, how that's parsed out in court. Right. Yeah. That's, it, it just, it kind of already smells like this is a cover up. And the only reason I say that is this was a dude who the last time I checked had something about 18 different uh, reports filed against him. And only a few of those, I think, uh, were even looked into. Some of them just were closed, if I'm not mistaken. And again, I could be speaking, um, you know, incorrectly, but he had something, he was already involved within like two or three other homicides within his career uh, on, the, on, the, on the police force. So it sounds like he definitely did go unchecked for a while. And I, I, I think the other gentleman, I'm not sure what his name was, uh, who was there also had some, uh, had some sort of uh, complaints filed against him as well. Um, so it just sounds like unchecked behavior. And that seems to be like the key when it comes to uh, law enforcement. And, and let me say this, I have no issue with law enforcement because I have family on both sides, cousins and uh, cousins through marriage that are good cops that go out there every day and, and put their life on, you know, put their life on the line. But the reoccurring theme is we have too many, in my opinion, unchecked bad cops who are, you know, spoiling it, you know, for everybody when it comes to the relation between regular everyday people, especially people within the inner cities who are policed differently than the folks who live in the suburbs. I live in that, you know, whatever, I live in the suburbs. And I don't have the same contact with the police that I do when I lived in South Central Los Angeles and when I lived in Pasadena, California. My behavior hasn't changed. I'm still doing the same stuff. Still, you know, same habits, same patterns, different city. But the area and the policing is a lot different. Here, how are you doing? You know, um, they're very nice in my experiences in, in South Central and Pasadena, where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you here? Who are you? Those type of things. So it's just that different level of uh, level of policing. And this, and this again, is just weird. As more stuff comes up, these guys worked at the same nightclub doing security. Possibly they might have known each other. They worked the same shift. Stuff's overlaps, things of that nature. Uh, it This is going to get a lot worse, I feel, before it gets a lot, a lot better. Yeah, and I mean, it's uh, it really doesn't help when you have a prosecutor's office like that in, in Minnesota, I believe it's in Minneapolis, I'm not sure what county that's covered, but who fails to kind of administer justice fairly and kind of clearly does it in a biased way. And it's incredibly transparent. I mean, in fact, what really set off all of the protests that we're seeing right now as we speak that are going on as we speak right. and record this 
um, was a, a press conference held by the FBI, a joint press conference by the FBI and by the county attorney and the U.S. attorney in that district. And the county attorney, who was essentially the DA in that in that area, who ended up filing charges, uh, made a comment um, along the lines of, you know, we're still looking into this. There is some evidence that tends to um, contradict criminal activity. In uh, other words, he was, he was implying. Yeah. So that statement really set off a firestorm. Not only was the was there an announcement that you're not filing charges yet, but in the, he kind of tipped his hand in such a way that you thought, well, maybe there's never going to be charges filed okay. in this case, right? That was on Thursday, I believe. I believe that was on Thursday. It was today, Friday. It was, it was Thursday afternoon, yes. Correct, yeah. And then Thursday night, you know, all hell broke loose. And then Thursday, Friday morning, he comes and announces that he's filing charges. So yeah. it's completely transparent. Nothing changed overnight. They didn't learn right. any evidence overnight. He just realized that, oh man, I, I better do what I do my job. And who knows what he intended to do or how long he planned to draw it out or what he was going to do. But he clearly demonstrated that um, not only has he made a contradictory statement as to the strength of the case, because Thursday he says that there's some stuff that indicates innocence. And then Friday he's saying, oh, I'm prosecuting this guy um but also he's showing that justice so to speak is bending to the circumstances mm -hmm. outside of that particular case in other words he's saying that the city break loose and go crazy so he's responding to that right which he's really not supposed to do in any case he's just supposed to do his job he's not supposed, yeah. like for example if there were no protests and riots and the precinct at minnesota wasn't burned down he probably wouldn't have filed the case and that that's not justice for anyone like the cop who got filed on shouldn't be like, oh, they burned down the precinct, so now I'm being filed on, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's just all around. It's just, it's poorly handled all around. And that sets us back so much. And that sets that sets back the job that I'm trying to do. And a lot of like, you know, good cops, so to speak, are trying to do, trying to, you know, right. um, repair some of the, the, the frayed um, tensions in the community. Right. Um, it just sets us back so much. It, I almost feel like, I don't want to say a tribunal because that's like a horrible word to use, but there needs to be, when these type of situations happen, there needs to be a council that involves the police and involves the community so things can be discussed to avoid, you know, the the protests, the riots, however, whatever word you want to attach to it, the unrest, the division that this causes, uh, you know, when it is something that, in my opinion, is clear cut that this was wrong. And there are people in the very beginning, so when this started, you know, I think it was Tuesday, maybe the first time I saw it, or Wednesday, there are a lot of people who said, hey, this is wrong. I can't believe this is happening again. And then as the rioting, the looting, the protests, whatever, now it has flipped. And now it's like the protesters, the rioters, the people who are tired of being preyed upon are the ones that are wrong. And it, it completely changes the narrative, in my opinion. And it takes away the focus from what we really need to be discussing is how do we make police relations better? How do we how do we strengthen this within the community? And again, now we're pointing to, wow, you know, look at these animals, look at these savages, look look at everything that they're doing. How do they expect for anything to uh, to change? And I think that's one of the most disappointing things is for me is that is that this continues to happen, but I feel like we are not prepared as a community to be able to make things better for us, or at least uh, or at least establish relationships that can allow us to try to make these situations better when this stuff happens. Yeah, yeah. And that's, it's interesting because there's usually, no matter what is seen on video, there's usually two sides in terms of voices that you hear you know you right. hear the voices who are saying oh the cop did wrong and then you'll hear voices that say well hold on let's wait for the facts kind of no matter what's on the video you know what i mean but right. this is one of those rare moments where basically no one could even argue over what was being seen on the video and i've only ever seen that you know in in the history of this whole camera phone sort of caught on camera police killing era that we're in, which is really only like since 2010, right? Since cell phones kind of got 
um, you know, had that 2008, 2010. It's only been about right. 10 years. I mean, years you can take it back since. to the camcorders with Rodney King being beat. You can go back. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, we'll, we'll, we'll take it back there because I think that was probably the biggest uh, one that, or, or that was yeah. the one that kind of jumped it off. That was the yeah, tip that's true. Of, that was a tip drill of police brutality, not to make light of what happened with Rodney King, but that right. that blew everything else up. Um, and then it became more commonplace uh, in what we were seeing. But check that out. That's interesting because even the Rodney King video, people right. were like, I don't see it. <laughs> I mean, a, a jury acquitted uh, those cops, right? right? So, uh, Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me? So yeah. um, it, so even with the Rodney King, there was no universal agreement on what was being seen on the video. So it's very rare for there to be a video where everybody's like, oh man, I, I can't even defend that, you know? Right. Um, it's happened one other time that I can remember. It was, I believe it was uh, South Carolina, I want to say, but I could be wrong, where the African-American guy is running away and the cop shoots him in the back. And it was a park, right? Is that the one where he's at the park, he's running, he gets he's shot in a park, I think. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that one, yes. Yeah. And that was, so these are the only two videos in my lifetime that I can remember there being a unanimous view of what is actually being seen on the camera. Um, so that, that's, that's interesting, right? But so in, in the absence of being able to disagree about what is actually happening on the video, the voices who would normally try to muddy those waters are now seizing on this idea of the protesters, the right. protesters, you know, they're animals, what are they doing? That's the narrative, that's the fodder, right? And look, I can't, I cannot, I'm not gonna sit here and condone violence and vandalism and, you know, a lot of people, good people are, who own businesses and, you know, they, they got their store, maybe they're a mom, pop, you know, kind of business owner and now they're, you know, their life's work is, is going up in flames over something that they had nothing, they weren't a part of, you know? or maybe they don't have a car and they rely on the target or they rely on the corner store that's being burned down. Right. So that's, right. That, that's all bad in a sense. Can you right. hear me? Dave? Yeah, no, I can hear you. They burned, they, there's yeah. actually a GoFundMe up right now for uh, this African-American gentleman whose sports bar was burned down. I guess he had just opened it or whatnot. Right. They, right. They went ahead and burned that down. So yeah, let's not, let's not pretend that there aren't people who have nothing to do with, uh, you know, what happens who are unfortunately losing a lot because of this. And um, I'm not, right. one, I'm not one who's pro loop and pro riot, but at yeah. some point, um, you know, what, what else do you do to express your frustration? You know, yeah, um, that's the other part of the statement too. Like, you know, and I heard a, an MLK quote, he said something like, uh, riots are the voice of the unheard, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like at a certain point, it's like, I, I, what, what do you, what would you have them do? You yeah. know, you, yeah, Kaepernick kneels and, and you're mad. So peaceful protests have been tried. Um, and so at a certain point, there is a breaking point, you know, there is, there is a point where you're, you felt like you've screamed into the wind enough and now you're going to scream at someone. And, um, and that's what's happening right now. And you know, sure, we can blame the protesters for some of them taking it out of, out of uh, out going out of overboard, and some of them may be opportunists. But for the most part, it's people who are really frustrated with the system that they feel like isn't working for them, specifically for them. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what we're seeing. And, and you know, here's the other thing too. It, I'm glad that people care. Yeah. You know, what if they yeah. were just so callous and so disengaged and so you know this 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 generation of millennials they take a lot of flack and i and i am a giver of that flack at some levels <laughs> you know I, I i you know this i always say that you know we've had generations of activism and this generation is postivism you know like divism they just want to share something you know yeah. it's not a sit-in it's a sharing for them like they're online only you know but now they're out there in the street so you gotta you gotta respect that um that they care and that it's not being unnoticed and that it matters. And sometimes that's the only way you can get the powers that, that be to listen. Uh, I don't know that there's gonna be any 
substantive change, to be honest. I kind of compare these incidents to like mass shootings. Mm -hmm. When the mass shooting happens, we're all talking about it. We're all talking about how we can change it. What can we do? And then there's this political debate and then it kind of just dies. Yeah. You know, well, and a lot of these, and then it happens again a few months later. And we're saying the same thing and the same voices have the same points mm -hmm. and, and nothing changes. And that seems to be the, the pattern that has emerged with these types of, of, of occurrences, unfortunately. So because this is just something that happens only in one community, like you said, it's happening all over. And, you know, you said, I don't know how we do stop that. Uh, do you think that there needs to be involvement at a much higher level when it comes to, uh, you know, whether it's the FBI, whether it's some other sort of government agency that really has to come in and, and start to police these things? Do you think that will change it when it isn't handled by internal affairs or something to that effect when there's actually yeah. a group in a branch in the government that handles police violence and only police violence is that is that kind of where we need to go give it its own light uh you know there i know that you know there's agencies within the cia or you know within the fbi shout out to criminal minds and all the other stuff i watch because i don't know i don't know the insides of that but you yeah. know ll cool j leads me to believe that there is a terrorist unit that is solely tracking <laughs> these types of terrorists so yeah. can we get ice t a job to be the guy who's looking into police brutality and nothing but police brutality can we link him more up <laughs> Um, you know, this is where it gets into, it gets complicated. The feds only have jurisdiction, jurisdiction on federal issues. The only means by which they've traditionally been able to intervene in local law enforcement um, matters, such as policing, which are at their, at their core, local state law enforcement issues. Like the constitution dictates that the feds can't get involved or can only get involved in local public safety law enforcement issues under certain circumstances. If asked or something to that effect, right? If they're reached if, out to you. Yeah, if asked, they can provide assistance. But when we're talking about oversight and enforcement, mm -hmm. they can only do that under certain circumstances. And typically what the feds have done is they've utilized the federal statute of civil rights violations okay. in order to intercede and get involved in uh, the way in which law enforcement's um, um, go about policing. For example, you saw um, Barack Obama's Justice Department under Attorney General Eric Holder um, open up an investigation into the Ferguson Police Department mm -hmm. um, back when that was, you know, bubbling up. And in fact, the uh, what Justice did they find? Um, they I, they found a lot of corruption, from what I understand, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and they and the Obama administration had a pretty robust um, sort of uh, agenda, for lack of a better word, to attempt to oversee local law enforcement by using that sort of civil rights catch-all. Um, unfortunately, that, you know, that, that if, if that's your interest, that Justice Department is gone, right? right? So this is what I want to tell people who complain about what the feds are doing or not doing. First of all, I want to ask them, did you vote? Mm. Because, you know, if it was a different administration, it may be handled differently. The feds may be getting involved. The feds precipitously pulled out of all matters involving local law enforcement related to policing along the lines of race. They pulled out under this administration. Wonder and why. That, yeah, that's from the top up, right? right? And so, you know, if the election would have gone a different way, then that policy would have gone a different way. And uh, so then I want to ask you, hey, who did you vote for? Did you vote? Um, but that aside, this was happening still, you know, a, a, even though that yeah. the Justice Department, it was still happening, right? That's why they opened up the, the reviews that they did. It really has to do with the lack of jurisdiction. The feds just don't have the same jurisdiction that the local law enforcement agencies do. So they're kind of left to their own devices unless the feds can come in under a civil rights theory and attempt to um, force some adjustments in that, in that regard. Um, and it gets kind of to be a more of a technical sort of legal um, analysis from there. Um, so, you know, unfortunately the states, the, the feds are at their strongest when they're dealing with matters of national security right. and of entire, the entire country interstate. Right. Right. And the states are at their strongest when dealing with matters of local law enforcement and public safety. That's just how the constitution works.
So then it just sounds like to me locally that needs to really be focused on. And I know there's, you know, like you said, the in, internal, uh, what do they call it? The internal affairs. I'm sure that's what happens within the local law enforcement. You know, you have a group of people that looks into that, but I don't want to say some sort of watchdog because that doesn't really work either. You know, they can blow the whistle, but who follows, you know, through with that. But there needs to be something done. And I don't know if it is voting locally, you know, when it's time to vote for, you know, um, whoever is going to be your district councilman, your mayor, whatever the situation may be, really looking into how they have really acted when these things have happened. You know, have they been uh, outraged by some of this or is this something that they have said nothing on at all? Because I think that's one of the biggest things right now. And, and I'm only speaking in regards to people that I personally mess with in my life. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking very closely to how this affects them, especially people who are not, um, of color. I want to see how you take this because, um, you know, at the end of the day, again, with everything we know, this is just another unjustified, you know, murder. And this is blatant. And like you said, probably one of the most cut and dry ones that, you know, has been presented to us. And there's still those people who are just kind of like, hey, whatever, you know, you should have, you know, you should have not done whatever you did. Used a $20 counterfeit bill. Shame yeah. on you. Even the store owner who called the police, he had to do what he had to do. That's his situation. You're trying to take from my business. I'm not a street cat. I need to pick up the phone and I need to go ahead and call the police. Right. Even he said that this didn't deserve for him to lose his life. Right, you know, right. In regards to this. So um, I think that's one of the biggest things that is shocking to me is not only the non folks of color who haven't said anything, but also the folks of color who are in the position of power who should be saying something. Said something when Biden said what he said, which, mm -hmm. in my opinion, thinking you're invited to the cookout and can say whatever you want to say and taking a man's life different sides of the pendulum in my you know in, yeah. in my in my opinion but um i think that's one of the most telling things now too is is you can clearly see the divide or the folks who are scared to speak and and, and that's very unsettling with me you know I, i'm i'm that's true i think we need voices out there but i'm almost uh I, I would prefer that celebrities and, and people like that would put their money where their mouth is mm -hmm. more than anything for real reform, the reform that they right, see. Right, right. Um, you know, they, there are millionaires and billionaires out there who are pumping money into certain political campaigns and are behind certain agendas in order to, to affect certain political and policy changes. I would like to see celebrities who have means and resources do something like that. Um, and it wouldn't even have to be something that they blow up on the gram or on their Twitter or what have you. I guess they could do that as well. Right. But uh, if they would actually put put their their money in, into some of these uh, causes that mm. they that they believe in. And there's actually really, there's some good reform that I've often criticized some of my friends who, not criticized, but I've, I've, I've strongly suggested that some of my friends who are more focused at protesting local district attorneys who they feel are not um, evenly applying justice in the case of local law enforcement officers with whom they deal with on a daily basis and rely on to make their cases and so on. Rather than focus their zeal and their efforts in that direction, they should focus their some of their zeal and efforts in the direction of their state legislatures who have the power to take the jurisdiction away from the local district attorneys and county attorneys and put it into the hands of a more review, uh, removed prosecutor um, mm -hmm. and deal with the law enforcement agencies on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Um, and that would, to me, I mean, that would, I mean, from my perspective as a prosecutor, that would work great for us because right. we would never have to be put in the position where we have to prosecute people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis and who rely on for cases and we wouldn't have that appearance of impropriety even right right if you had someone who's prosecuting cases who's more removed than someone who's actually i i i'm a prosecutor in the same city where this cop works right um even though a lot of offices take great um they make great efforts to try to sort of try to be unbiased and wall off those two worlds of prosecuting police versus working with them 
I think we have an issue of the appearance of impropriety. Yes. And it's not like a district attorney can just give up their jurisdiction and no longer prosecute cops. That has to be something that's done from a state legislature's perspective. And so reform like that, that could probably accomplish more than knocking down the door of your local county district attorney or county attorney. I think more focused um, protest and reform around what what really is is are the issues. And these are structural issues. Never mind the fact, D, that um, the prosecution of police officers are some of the toughest cases for a number of reasons, but not the least of which, and maybe mostly because jurors don't want to convict cops. They want to believe that people who wear a badge and who protect them, who run into the burning buildings as they run out, who run towards the gunshots as, as you run away from them. They want to believe that those people who are from a uh, unbiased perspective are, you know, their job is I think it takes it takes some gusto. It takes, it takes some bravery to, to do that type of job. Um, they don't want to believe that those people are out to do anyone harm. And they would rather believe that it's a mistake, you know, but in your job, in my job, well, maybe not my job, if I make a mistake, you know, whatever, depending on your job, right? Well, I shouldn't say your job either, because you're messing with people's money. So <laughs> in some people's jobs, right? If you make a mistake, it's like, all right, we'll figure it out tomorrow, right? But yeah. some jobs dealing with your livelihood, sense. your it's life or death, right? And so it's like, um, so people, jurors, as they sit in the jury box and they listen to this case, a lot of times they want to give cops the benefit of the doubt. Right. And so... Yeah, prosecutors take that into account before they bring a, a, a case against a police officer. Right. Am I going to win this? Right, and I imagine a lot of times on the flip side, it's who am I? Who's the defendant, or, or who's the, who's the actual person that died or was beaten in this case? And, and what they did, and they tried to do this with uh, the Mister uh, uh, was it Floyd gentleman? Is yeah. they they started trying to bring up you know past history? You know, did you know yeah. he did this? Do you know he did that? And it's automatically, it, it a lot of times when this, when these uh, police, uh, you know, brutality or, or, or murder uh, killings happen, it's automatically the person who was beaten or killed. Now let's, let's, let's just make you look like the criminal uh, that we want to paint you out to, which then also makes it harder, I would imagine, to have to prosecute that case uh, because now you're planting that seed of doubt into that juror's mind when they look at, you know, in this case is this black man who was easily six and some change, you know what I mean? Um, you know, I'm sure they'll pull up old songs of, you know, him talking about whatever he did or, right. or whatnot. And then that'll be yeah. the picture that's painted. Um, you know, that this person, this police officer feared for his life right. and was just doing his job. Um, and I could see where a civilian, a regular person, um, who unfortunately watches TV and when they see us, they don't see us in the best light all of the time. See what you did there on the TV reference and then the, when they see us reference. You see that, you like that, there you go. <laughs> uh, Not only that, that, Dina, and I'll say this also, two points. Point number one, the idea of sliming up a victim so that the jury doesn't care about them anymore and then acquits whoever is accused of the thing, that's not unique to a police case. Uh, that's every single case that I prosecute. They're always trying to slime up the victim yeah. and make the jury like not feel for that person anymore. So that happens in these police cases. There are some racial tropes maybe around it as well that you need to these police cases, right? But um, so that's a common sort of defense tactic. The other thing I want to say about juries and how they view these types of cases, you also got to look at it like this. Who's responding to the juror summonses and exactly. actually showing up exactly. and actually it's going to be on the jury right and so then we got it you know the idea of not voting and not being registered to vote it's not just about always you know punching your ballot right. but it's also about are they going to be able to contact you so you get on the jury and so that you represent a cross-section in the community to oh, where you can bring a balanced perspective to it right if the only people who respond to their jury summonses and who are willing to serve in that capacity are people who are otherwise conservatively minded or should i say people who have one sort of life experience right it's going to be even more difficult to prosecute cases such as that and that again it, and you know that kind of comes back to the responsibility of the community of people who no problem going out and protesting but maybe have a problem responding to that jury summons or maybe have a problem being registered as a voter and keeping up with that. Yeah, just voting, 
yeah, just get registering to vote and vote. And I tell people all the time, even if you're not voting for who the president is, do your, you know, at least go in and make sure you're voting locally. So you at least know who is representing you yeah. within the city that you, that, that you live in, who has your interests, you know, going forward. But yeah. I, I, I don't think that we as a community are really hip to that. We don't understand how, you know, voting impacts zoning and impacts, you know, the amount of money that might be coming into the school system in your local community right. where, your ch where your child goes to, you know, they don't, we, we're not really taught and educated that we're just like, Hey, who you voting for president? Oh, right. I'm not voting for him. Cause he doesn't like a, B, C, and D. And let's segue into that right. because, um, that's something again, Can I say one more thing about that. D? One more, one more, one more Go plug ahead. for voting. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, People only care about if you have a job, well, not only, but if you're an employee, for the most part, you want to do a good job, you should, but you also care about what your boss thinks of you, who has a power to shape your career in one way or the other, right? Right. Why would politicians care about certain communities if those communities are have no say whatsoever on whether or not they're going to be in office next year? Right. They're going to make moves for the communities who hold them accountable and who can change the trajectory of their career, you know? And so by not having a voice in terms of that at the ballot box, these politicians are not going to do anything for those communities who are not showing up, period, right. point blank. So there's no way to hold accountable politicians so that they will act in your interest because you're really not, you have nothing to do with, with, with their livelihood or their bottom line whatsoever. And so it's one of those things where you are complaining about a system that you're not participating in. I mean, so anyways, that I could talk about that for a while. Not that vote is the silver bullet. Voting is not the silver bullet. I'm not, you know, saying it is, but it's, it's something that that is one of those. Yeah, it's one of those things that that builds. It's a building block towards it all. I think. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's a start. And I agree with you 100 percent because I feel if we were at more active voters, then we couldn't have someone sit down and and and, and on a media forum tell us, hey. If you don't vote for me, you're not really black. Right. So there's if a segue. Vote, yeah, that's a segue. If the vote, okay. if our vote was really valid, then we would not be talked to that way. I mean, that's very eye opening to me. I know that they've tried to clean it up, um, you know, and people have come to his defense. Uh, but it, it just once I heard that, once I saw that, it was just further confirmation that n neither side, so to speak, really cares about about the black vote, you know, or the people who are casting the black vote. Let's say that. Um, all I want is your vote. I'm, I don't really care what's going to happen to your community. So if I can tell you that I'm down with you, and if you're not down with, you know, Joe Biden, then suck it, you know, DX style or, or, or whatnot. But yeah. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of what the conversation was, and or, or for him to end that conversation that way. Double down mm. on what you're going to do for the community. Don't double down on calling out our blackness uh, if you don't vote for me. And then who's the people in the room having this conversation with Biden on how to approach this interview and some of the things not to say. And if there was a piece of paper, that should have been on the not to say piece of paper, probably at the top. Um, <laughs> it's like, hey, you know what? People mess with you because you were the vice president for Obama. Didn't mess yeah. with you beforehand. And uh, you got, you know, you got some explaining to do on a couple of things that you co-signed or might have introduced that spawned and turned into something else. So yeah. can you please just stay away from, you know, throwing up the bl black power fist and saying Wakanda forever at the uh, at the end of your interview with Charlemagne the God? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that what he did? <laughs> he didn't, but I, he, I mean, if you listen, if you vote for Trump, then obviously you're not a brother. Yeah. Wakanda forever. You know, I mean, that's basically, uh, uh -huh. that's, that's how we should have ended the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's like, to me, there's like two different minds. There's like this theme that what he said invokes this sort of generalized thing of the Democrats taking the black vote for granted and, and recognizing the Democrats, the Democratic Party, recognizing that there's really no other alternative. Yeah. for the African-American community. So it's like kind of like, we're the only game in town. Like the other side openly hates you. Right. Like, so what's up, right? So there's that exaggerated as stated, right? It's exaggerated a little bit, but there's that theme that 
what he said sort of invokes and captures in a lot of people's minds. And I think there's another thing of like, well, what did he actually mean in that moment? You know? And to me, I kind of, I'm trying to, I kind of separate those things because although what he said invoked that theme, I'm not sure if it came from that place or not. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But there's also the substance of the comment and sort of what he meant in that moment. And I got to tell you, he said something I've said before my damn self. And I think I- You can say that though. That's- I've, I've, okay, fair enough. I phrased it in a rhetorical way, like, why would you vote this way if you're black or if you're Latino? Like I've, that's how I've kind of phrased it, but I think it's the same message. In other words, it's one of those things where it's like, you shouldn't have said it, but it's true in my opinion. Um, and I think there's a lot of people, black people who took it that way. Like, nah, you, you know, you're getting too comfortable, you know, like take your feet off the coffee table kind of deal. Right, right. But at the same time, it's like, you know what? that's actually true. And, and a lot of people felt that way. In fact, I was looking at one of the last days I, I was on social media, um, a colleague of mine who teaches the same school I teach, a uh, Caucasian guy, he was posting like, you know, this is so tone deaf and you shouldn't do this and da, 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 da. all these like people who appeared to be Caucasian were responding and really laying by now. And then a black person came on and they're like, he said something like, wow, you know, uh, white people are more angry about this than white pe- than black people. He's like, that should tell you something. And I think it, it should in the sense that like, it's kind of true, but you shouldn't have said it. And it kind of reminds us of this idea that the Democrats take us for granted, you know, which is what Kanye was speaking on. Not going to get into Kanye defense. There we go, yeah. Uh, we already had a whole episode about that. We, we, we've done a few that, episodes. But on that point, I felt him because that's one of the things he said. He said, you guys are, you know, full, full on Democrats because you're black, but what have they done for you lately? And they're probably taking you for granted. And that point, I, I re- resonated with me a bit. Or at least I, I, I thought he had a point on that one. Um, but, you know. Put on a MAGA hat. And it was out right. There. Then, yeah, I didn't, then he lost me, but he had a good point there. And I think that that the, the comment that Biden made kind of reminds us of that, but come on, bro. No, it's, it's factual. Say that ain't true. Is it true? Yeah, it is true. No, because some, Hey, you know what? We're not a monolithic group. Yeah. Us people of color. Some people right. are like Trump supporters, you know what right, I mean? Right, definitely. Um, and if you talk to them and I've debated them and they've had some, some comebacks for me that it I've been like, Oh, yeah. that's kind of true. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I just can't, you know, I don't know how you can come down on that side ultimately. Well, I do know how you can, but I just don't think you sh- that it makes sense to. It makes sense. Um, so, but I, I get, you know, it's it's true, but he shouldn't have said it in my yeah, opinion. But I think what bothers me, and, and, and I love the fact that you brought up the the colleague um, and how he was enraged and, and, and his people were enraged too. And I think that's because they get that he literally said, look, I'm not really going to offer you anything. Other than mm-hmm. I'm running against a guy that I openly know you guys dislike, you know, yeah. and yeah. It's either you go with him or you stay with me. For a lesser extent, it's, it's like the dude who has two baby mamas and you got to right. stay on one's couch. You got the one that really hates you. And then you got the one that still kind of lets you sleep in the bed and, yeah. and, and might even, you know, take care of you, might even cook you some food. You got the one that's just like, you know what? You're my kid's father. You can stay on the couch, Leonard, and that's it. You know, you're probably going to want to go with the other baby mama, right? Um, and I just felt like, again, too soon. This was the first time that you've spoken in a while on a black mm-hmm. media outlet. And sure. you were challenged with questions, and I'll give Charlemagne a lot of props for asking about some of the drug laws and some of the things that he put in effect, in effect, or we thought he put into effect. And I think Biden did a good job of distancing himself from what happens and talking about the entire process, making himself look less of a villain. But again, at the very end, to say, look, you know, the reason you should vote for me is because these are the plans that I have in place. You yeah. just don't automatically pull out you know, the race card or, or, yeah. or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, if you're chilling with your, a lady, she ends up going to the bathroom. Hold on, let me slip into something else. You're like, hey, game time. You know, she comes back and you're in your boxers. And she yeah. was like, oh, I was about to get in some sweats or something like that. You know, <laughs> you're literally jumping the gun in that in that yeah. situation. Like, I haven't seen the whole interview. It sounds like he may have had, you know, Charlemagne. It was a good interview up until... Yeah. 
you know, here's here's a black card. See it. Yeah. Use so it. I mean, you know, can we really say that he didn't tell the black community what he has to offer? I mean, I think it's unfortunate that that interview ends up amounting to that soundbite. Right. Um, but it sounds like I think even from what you're saying, Charlemagne hit him with some questions and he, and he presented his case as to why the black community should vote for him. It sounds like. Um, so I think he- a defense of- A defense of the record? Yes, Here, here's my record. Let me talk to that. Yeah. And then, you know, he had to go because they're like, oh, you're running late. You had to go. Yeah. And it was, you know, and maybe oh, okay. he did have something planned. I'm going to give you the rest of this okay. plan. But it was just kind of like mic drop. You know, like if you don't vote for if you vote for Trump, you don't vote for me. You're not black. Good night, Compton, and drop the mic and just walk. Hey, up. you know what happened? He had he had a black uh, uh, aide in his campaign who dropped that line to much laughter, probably. And then he heard that and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna use that." And he goes on there and it's just like, Pharrell "No, you're it. not. Yeah. You should <laughs> use that." <laughs> Props to Charlemagne for not like freaking out or anything. I think he just kind of went to the next topic from what I saw. It was it was at the very end, like I said, it was at the end, and and okay. and he got that Charlemagne got that sound bite that he's and he said himself, "Hey." You know what? It is what it is. Take it how right. you want. You know, and a lot of people have come out in defense of him. But what, right. as a community, aside from each of our own personal issues that we have going on, what do you think should be, uh, especially for the younger demographic, what do you think should be some of the issues that they're really focusing on now that it's definitely Trump versus Biden, unless something else happens? What, you know, what are the questions that they should be asking? What are the things that they really should be concerned about going forward well first of all i want to say they should not be hung up on a crime bill from what is that 1994 crime bill so we're talking about 25 year old crime bill right. which by the way had bipartisan meaning both sides support from democrats yeah. and from republicans which by the way had the support of the black caucus at the time who right. was because they were the mayors and the congressional representative of cities that were being crushed by drive-by shootings and a murder rate that was out of this world. And they were approaching Washington in such a way that they felt that their communities were under siege. So they wanted those tough on crime bills. Like right. the black leaders in those cities, Detroit, Atlanta, those congressional representatives of the black caucus, which is the most influential um, caucus of color in in the United States Congress, they were for the crime bill. Now, they there were certain parts of it they didn't like at the end. They were like, oh, we object to this or that. But on the whole, that was a bipartisan bill that uh, was passed during a time where the people who were dying looked like us. Right. And that's out of that um, circumstance emerged everything that we know about hip hop. NW, your NWAs, your Dr. Dre's, your Nas, your J's, all of them came out of that late 80s, early 90s crime wave. And it, and it was, you know, it's the difference between the music that we hear now and the music that we heard then, because there was some real stuff going on. And that was, that was what was going on at that time. So when, when people try to turn back ends of time and look at Joe Biden and say, well, why did you vote for that crime bill, Joe Biden? I, I, I think that's, uh, that's wrong headed. And it's a misread of history. It's a misread of what actually happened. It's a misread of what people thought at the time. Now, maybe it was overdone. Um, I think it was overdone. I think that we passed some things that uh, that had some negative collateral consequences, right? Understatement of the year. But it's what people thought at the time. So don't come at Biden or even Hillary as they did last time and say, wait, look what you did to the black community. Because all, actually the black community was on board with that. The black leaders were on board with that and the actual the people in the community who were not involved in gangs or drugs or guns they were for it as well because people in an atmosphere of fear and of crisis mistakes are made and decisions are are made without much thought you know a lot of times and that's what happened and that's everyone so in terms of what people should be looking for people of color should be looking at for this election not that. How about not that? How about not dig into the archives and try to apply 2020 retrospect and talk about mass incarceration, say Biden, you caused it. He didn't cause it. Um, it was a, a combination of events that where people made mistakes, um, it, as it turns out, right? But nobody could really predict that. I don't, or maybe they could have, but they didn't. No one did. 
Um, so that's that. And in general, I think that the idea of going back into what Biden did in the 80s and the 90s, or really anybody did, um, and now I'm talk, thinking about like the Anita Hill scandal um, with uh, Clarence Thomas. And yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think that that makes any sense to go back in, in time in that way. I mean, a lot of us aren't even, who are criticizing him that way, aren't even maybe 30 or 35 years old, right? They can't even I think no idea about- who Anita Hill is, you know? Right, so- Like Rick Hill's mama? What did you- <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, that gets me when we have the, the two woke crowd Who's often too woke to vote, by the way? Yeah, but they're 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 too woke to really you know support Biden because of the ninety four crime bill, the racist ninety four crime bill, which blacks supported. Like that to me, that doesn't make sense. Um, I it, it's a it's a unique election, D. Um, I think that the uh, the number one concern of anyone who who wants to go out and march into the streets right now because of what's happening with law enforcement should be a changing of the guard. That should be their number one concern. I don't think that we have the um, luxury of, of political nuance right now. We just mm -hmm. don't. You know, we're talking about right now you're at the point where, you know, you're walking to work. All you want to do is just save up for a car right now. You know, you think about putting rims on it later or getting the nicest car you can. Right now, we need the bare minimum, and we need we need a vehicle to get from point A to point B. Right. And I think right now, that's all we need to worry about. Once we get there, we can improve it a little bit, but we don't have the luxury to sit back and nitpick, um, you know, on these issues. I mean, we I think we should push. I mean, I think people who care and who are concerned should push for the causes that they want, but not in such a way that it destroys the likelihood of any progress whatsoever. So the car then, the vehicle is do, making the changes at the local level, making changes in your local community. And of course that, you know, event, uh, eventually trickling up. And there'll be people who say, well, that just takes too long. But I look at it the other way. If you make the changes first within your community, you're making it better for yourself right off the bat. And then that spreads out elsewhere. So if you're in the community yeah. and you're actively making the changes, you're going to you're going to be a part of the change happening to you quicker rather than it happening somewhere else and then you getting word and then passing something and then this this county adopts the same thing that this county is doing. So if you're not helping affecting change and you're just waiting in the water, so to speak, waiting for things to change, you're gonna be waiting a long time. Yeah. 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 And, and I was what I was what I was talking about was the top of the ticket. But you're right. Uh, the local local issues matter sometimes more than what's happening at the top. Um, and it's hard, though, because what's that? As far as things happening quicker, because there'll be those people and, and we know one who will say, man, I'm not voting because it doesn't matter if I if I don't for if I, if I vote for Biden or Trump. But, you know, I live in wherever. I live in Rialto or I live in, you know, Riverside or whatnot. Trump ain't going to do nothing that's going to help me in, you know, in Riverside or Rialto. So for those people with that mentality, and I think that's a lot of black and brown who have that mentality, it's almost better to sell them on trying to make the changes at in the community or at home first before even trying to pitch to them a larger agenda because they're going to be so detached from it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, you know, there the, the idea of change is, I don't know, you know, people want to see instant gratification and see change right now. And if you're in the business of, of change, then, uh, you know, the, 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 the long moral arc, the long arc of, of uh, the moral arc of history is long, but it bends, you know, towards that. Like, it takes a while. It does. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that the issues that people need to be concerned with is number one, the vehicle from point A to point B, and to my mind, that's happening at the top of the ticket. The gotcha. um, I, 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 I personally am not for um, slamming Biden in such a way that it deactivates the, the, uh, the electricity or the energy around um, him prevailing. Um, yeah, we, we all, we can nitpick or we can, you know, we Do can- do you think yeah. he will win, Biden? Do you think that with the, the corona and just Trump 
wild ways every day. Do you think that Biden has a has a chance, or is this just uh, pretty much a, you know a, a, an exercise in you know attrition at this point? The B- Biden's Achilles heel is also his uh, something that could work in his favor, and that is the current um, atmosphere where he cannot. Coronavirus is causing an atmosphere that is pretty much debilitating for the economy, which is hurting Trump. But it's also causing an, an atmosphere where we can only hear from Biden from his basement. <laughs> um, and for that reason, like, you really can't campaign from your basement. And Trump is willing to go out there with no mask and do whatever. And he also has a spotlight of the presidency. Right. So you got a guy who's on Zoom from his basement, and you got another guy who has the platform of the President of the United States. Like, that's not great. On the other hand, depending on how this coronavirus thing shakes out, if it shakes out very poorly for, for, for the president, then maybe Biden may win by default Biden. from the basement. He'll give his acceptance speech from the basement. Well, listen, let's call him Big Tigger because BT in the basement was popping back in the day, and so there's a blueprint to how he can have some people come hang out with him in the in, in the business or in the basement. Yeah. But also, this is the this is social media. You have an artist like Takashi Six Nine who is b- breaking the internet almost every single time he says something. So they have to find a way to harness that. Um, and, and even if he's stuck in his basement on Zoom, I think that is better. You for think him. Biden could ever really break the internet? <laughs> You know what? I think a conversation between him and Barack Obama probably got the most clicks ever from for saying that if you were if you vote for Trump, you ain't black. That's probably the most clicks he ever got in this entire campaign. Oh, imagine uh, if him and imagine if him and Barack sat down and talked about things. That breaks the internet. Even if you yeah. bring Michelle Obama on, that breaks the internet. But let's then you're say, out of people after those let's two. Say, let's say Jay Z. You bring the right people on to have that conversation. You're going to break the internet, and he needs to do that. My biggest issue, optically, with Biden is his need to kiss on people a lot younger than him. Girls, you know, hug. He's very touchy feely. He's he's that he's yeah. that old school. Know, he's that weird kind of uncle type of guy. Like, oh, it's Uncle Jeff. And Uncle Jeff wants to hug you for a little longer and kiss you on your your forehead or whatever. So him being confined in a basement, um, if they can strategically pull that off with who they can bring to the table, who he could go ahead and sit down and talk to, uh, a T.I. There's a lot of people who will want to talk to him. And if he could pull that off. But the problem is when the more he talks to black people, the bad... bad things can happen don't you think like you can say the the wrong thing here's the thing tighten up your team and again two sheets of paper one with what you can say and the other with the ish that you're not supposed to say so again i think and again it doesn't have to be black people there's all kinds of people who would want to sit down and talk with the next president i'm sure george clooney would want to come and sit down and talk to there's a lot of people george clooney that don't really have that everyday internet appearance or 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 yeah. that internet you know george is not actively tweeting things to my knowledge you know so yeah. imagine again if you sat down biden and Clutie sat down and had a conversation that's going to break the internet uh when are we voting november what uh it's early november i'm going to say the fifth it's usually like, the first yeah. tuesday of november yeah so you have how many weeks in order to have those sit downs and, and really talk to people who have that presence if you feel that I'm not going to be able to campaign because of the coronavirus and Trump doesn't care. He's going wherever, you know, he's golfing in seven foot weeds. You know what I mean? He, he, you know, he's out there. And if you're not, then you need to make yourself available through, you know, this little box that's in front of us and then sit down with some people who definitely have some sort of pool and can give you that spotlight. So sitting in the basement in this day and age, you know, there's rappers doing 10 million views that are, you know, in their mama's closet right now, uh, you know, making it happen. So that, to me, can't really be an excuse to why he might not win. You know, I just think that it's, as you stated, a lot of dirt on his name and, and a lot of us not understanding what we really should be scrutinizing and really should be looking at. Um, so he's got to get out there and he's got to educate 
uh, people to all the falsehoods that are going to be run about him or, or the way that some of these memes and things uh, will be used against him because we know that the other side's uh, fan base and Trump supporters, they don't care what information comes out about this dude. They're going to... No, they don't. They don't. And that's hard to beat when... I, I think he's... The Bernie supporters are going to be like another thing that could be his downfall too, man. So they vote for who? Uh, a third party? They, they vote... They throw their vote in the wind? Vote for nobody, or they vote for just, yeah, or just don't even show up. I See, and that's, if they do that, then that, in my opinion, completely devalues, uh, you know, anything Bernie ever tried to run on and establish if, if they aren't willing to continue the fight. Because I know he's willing to continue to, to support in whatever way he needs to. And if his, if his supporters are that fickle, then, you know, what was going to happen if he did get elected and the going got tough? Right, right. I mean, they would have probably jumped off that train. Uh, but they did that to, to Hillary, though. A lot of them didn't even show up. Right. But Because I, Bernie didn't win. Right. And I think that was, I, I think in the terms of likability at the time, um, or, or when Hillary was running versus when Biden's running now, I'd probably give... Biden maybe this much more likability than 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 Hillary at that time. You know what I mean? And again, she just had an aura around her at the time that you know was I think was uncomfortable for a lot of people. You know, um, and especially women, which was shocking to me. I thought that women would have supported her more. Um, and when some of those numbers came back, in some places Trump got more support from the ladies. Uh, than yeah. Him. So. Hey, a lot of people thought of that. There's actually a really good. Uh, documentary on on hulu about the whole about hillary in general and about that campaign specifically and you know, a lot of people say she faced a lot of uh the whole likability sort of metric was like code word for not a dude you know just because she didn't have that same playbook or we didn't really have that same historical framework to look at a, a president like that like her and it translated in, into this intangible feeling of uh, there's just something about her that I just don't like. And it's like, that's how our biases, you know, male versus female kind of manifested themselves in this kind of, you know, nebulous, vague likability. And I agree with you. Look, there are more charismatic, um, more gifted speakers um, than Hillary, um, for sure. So, you know, no disagreement there. But it's interesting to think about, like, to what degree uh likability like for instance hit, um bernie almost beat her right, right? and in, in the primary biden pretty much crushed bernie yeah like it wasn't even close at the end and hillary they were like neck and neck for a while especially in some of the more sort of conservative states like michigan and like you know mm -hmm. ohio and stuff like that in the primaries they had a hard time voting for hillary um, and they were going Bernie a lot of the times, but, and everybody thought that Bernie was so strong because of his showing against Hillary that he gave her such a run for her money. But then when it came down to the get down, he was up against another white dude. You know, he really didn't put up much of a fight at all. And, and it's not like Biden's the best candidate. Biden's like that much more likable, as you say, than Hillary, right? But it wasn't even close. And I think that disparity exposed some of the uncomfortableness that a lot of people have around getting behind a female leader. Um, it's kind of a anything but her kind of thing. You know, it's, and it's, it's kind of like the Obama thing. Like in order for a black president to be elected, he had to be the perfect, the yeah. most charismatic, the most likable, the perfect family, the smartest guy. He had to be all those things to get over the black hump. Hillary didn't have enough to get over the, the female hump, yeah. but there was a female hump that she was up against. You know what I mean? Yeah, and no. Sometimes I it's, it's a uh, this the world that we live in man is 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 a sad and amazing place at the same time and and so i know you have to go so we're going to go ahead and, and 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 wrap this up but i do want to come back later and talk about how this unfolds and also how once we get down to you know really seeing who's running with biden and and some of those choices i think that's going to be a great conversation to have. What do you well. think, Kamala? Would you would you go with Kamala? Or I don't you know, want to see she didn't do really well here in California. I know that someone that you campaigned for at the time made some phone calls for. Her. No, I actually didn't. No, I thought you I mean, did. I thought you made phone calls for her mm -mm, at some mm -mm. point. No, who did you? No, no. 
No, because you were the one that hit me to Kamala. And, uh, um, you know, when you were... Yeah, in the final analysis, though, I didn't really do anything for her campaign. I, I, uh, I did make some phone calls for Hillary last time around. It was Hillary. Uh, look, I mean, I like Kamala. She was a fine uh, a candidate. Um, you know, her issue, she was confronted with a lot of the wokesters who were like, but you were a prosecutor. Right. And how could you have been a prosecutor and you put people in prison and you did X, Y, Z. And I think she kind of cowered from that past and she really tried to explain away like why she was a prosecutor and yeah. kind of, uh, you know, she backed off of that. And I don't think, I don't think she should have done that. She should have faced that a little bit more. Um, on that. Yeah. A little more. Yeah. She should have been like, look, look, yeah, I prosecuted people. People who murder people should be in prison. I put them in prison. I'm sorry that they look like you and me. Yeah. And it's, it, the reason why they look like you and me is because of structural racism and a history of discrimination and lack of opportunities, lack of educational um, uh, ability and financial resources. But they shot and killed someone. And Maybe. by the way, that was also someone of color. And right. there was also a black mother on that side. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like she should have come at it that way. She was way too apologetic for her resume. And that was her entire resume. She was a prosecutor through and through, the DA of, of, of San Francisco, then the Attorney General of California. So, and then that propelled her to the Senate. And when you take that away, and the left wokesters took that away as it being a benefit to her, um, she really had nothing left, you know? But I thought she was a decent candidate. Uh, I don't know if she'd make a great running mate for Biden. She may be too similar to him. Yeah. Um, I really have liked, I know we we're about to go, but I really would have liked to have seen. Um, I don't know if you're hip to this cat, um, Andrew Gillum from Florida. Yeah, but Tallahassee. Florida that they found with the crack pipe and all that kind of stuff like that in Florida, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't do it. He was can't his, 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 his turn up was too real. He, he up went was down. Great. We can't have the vice president with some dudes in a crack pipe in a, in a hotel no. room in Miami. Listen, can't have that. if you're choosing to do that, eliminate the crack. Go get you, you do yes. whatever. I had no issue with that. Um, and it'll go. Yeah. This, this is my narrative for everyone who chooses to step outside of your marriage and you're rich. Pay for a professional to step out of your relationship with, and most likely you'll be fine and you can go on doing a great job because you don't have to be a great husband or a great wife or a great partner to be great at the yeah. job that you do. But the minute you interject narcotics, and uh, gerbils or any other strange little things into you stepping outside of your marriage. That as as a uh, as a uh, Randy is it Randy Jackson was that the dude from uh, from uh, American Idol as as yeah, he yeah, as he yeah. once said that's a nah for me dog <laughs> yeah that's, a, <laughs> that's uh, your I, PSA higher high class uh, call girls if you're gonna, you're gonna step out on your wife listen I don't condone that I'm not cheating on my wife but. If you are going to do that, Wendy's not on this episode. and there's a, there's a lot of people, she listens, so she knows, uh, there's a lot of people who choose to do that. And there's a lot of high profile people who choose to do that well, to do that right. as well. So it makes no sense to me. Do that well, I heard you just uh, uh, yeah. that. It makes no sense to me <laughs> that if you are a multimillionaire, let's yeah. case in point, this, uh, the, the dude from, uh, I think he's Earl Thomas. I don't know if he's a Seahawk or wherever he's from. Uh, yeah, his, his former Seahawks. He's in the Ravens now. Yeah, his woman goes through his woman goes through Snapchat to find him. Like, come on, man, you're a millionaire. You know what I mean? You can, <laughs> whatever little fantasy you want to pull off, you have the money to go ahead and make that happen. Drop some coin, do what your little dirt is, go home, and then everything is cool. But unfortunately, you know, people are controlled by their impulses and, and don't truly risk takers out here, bro. That's how they got to where they are. We're taking them risks. No, you can't he be out here being conservative and get to where they're at. He went, he went to practice every day. He listened to what the coaches had to say. He read that's his. That's true, but he was flying across the middle of that field, taking somebody's head off, because worse that's than what, that CTE. That's what he was asked to do, and it might have been the CTE. And I said, "Yeah, you know what? I, even though my, even though my, uh, all my info's in the Snapchat, and wifey knows that my." Password is one two three boo boo. Um, you know, I'm still gonna go out oh, here. That's the NFL's fault for putting him in that position. And that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. That's some safety protocols. 
because we need to talk about what Jay is doing. Uh, does he go, does he hold a benefit concert? Because supposedly that Rock Nation deal was supposed to eradicate all police brutality. And uh, Jay it, did nothing yet, bro. Jay I, I is agree. about as green. It He's was. never been about that cause. No. Listen to his music. Listen to his, you know, four by four. You know, his if I can't get four? rich. Is, it, is that what it is? I think that's oh, it's it. four, four, four. Uh, I thought it was four by four. I you don't only, know. You only did nah, that. I was overrated. You only did that because you're a Kanye fan. I, 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 I was overrated. But he said, I can't help the poor from one of them. So I get rich and give back to me. That's the win win. You know, I haven't rap, been rapping since Common Sense. He's been always about his cash. He's never about been anything else other than that. No, I agree. And we, really we discussed that on the show. And it was funny to see how what change was going to happen, especially with the NFL and how they've treated their players. I see no changes, you know, in regards to, to that whatsoever. But, uh, man, I just, again, thank you for sitting down and, and, and really uh, uh, helping us understand the perspective of – the law side of it, because that's where this heads now. Um, we talked about what we can do as a, com you know, within the community, uh, but hopefully the conversation for these folks that don't know the other side of the law, hear kind of what folks like yourself, um, who are folks within the law system that want to make sure that they're doing the best that they can uh, for the people, they love the job that they're doing and, th and they understand how important the job that they're doing is, especially when it's done without any bias. So hopefully that's something that people take away from this. And again, I wanna have you back soon so we can you know, d discuss this long road to either Biden being our next president or what are we gonna do with another four years of, uh, you know, of Trump? Where does that take us and, and you know, and, and how does that look? Uh, that's a, that'll be the next season of the, the reality show, bro. <laughs> hey, hey, just remember, the sequel's never as good as the first one. So we in for, we in for a ride. <laughs> and I don't even want to think about what else could happen <laughs> since this guy has taken over. And that's the cold part is, not saying that he deserves to be looked at any other way, but he is going to be looked at as having, as some of the worst stuff happening, Corona, all this type of stuff happening under his watch. And at the end of the day, um, I don't know where he, once it's done, I don't know where he goes. I don't know where he goes to hide. I don't know how he avoids uh, all the scrutiny. I'll give Bush props. Somehow Bush took his horrible presidency and then came out on the other side as like this yeah. lovable caricature. You know, hey, it's, it's George W. Hey, George W. Yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. how Trump comes out this other side uh, other than looking, you know, really bad not saying again not let me tell saying, you the second the, the the second act is going to be scorched earth because what really does he have to fear he can't be voted out once right. he gets to the other side of this yeah zero checks i mean it's not like he's fearing anything now can you imagine he's already, he's already threatening to punk social media he's just gonna start coming for people he don't like he's gonna see something you say and he's gonna introduce something into the bill he's gonna be like yeah that <laughs> Hey, Mike, <laughs> is there a part of you a little bit that's like, man, he's a cold cat? Like, you know how you kind of rooted for the uh, the heel no. in wrestling? There's no. no part of you that's like, you, you know what? They hit him with a sledgehammer, Triple H. No, you know what? Because, because I you got like, a sledgehammer. That's kind of badass. I like heels that are cold and calculating. <laughs> Nothing that he does is calculating. He just goes out and that's says true. whatever he wants to say. And and if he had if he was that's calculated. True. And and had some sort of super villain villainatry. I don't even know there's a word, but villain, whatever. If he had a little bit of super villainism to him, then uh -huh. I might rock with him. But he's really the rich dude in the movie that you realize is not really the mastermind. It's really he some. He tells other you his whole plan, like right before he kills you, and you use the plan in order to like. You to don't even get. get to, it. You know, you don't even get to that part. He's the one that's like, it has to be this guy because he's got all the money. He has the access to everything, and then you go to bust him, and he's dead. And it's really the other guy that you had no clue was really yeah. the villain. You know, he's just really the puppet uh, in his back. Not saying that you know presidents that came before him weren't, but I think he is really the face of the puppet president. And I, and I really believe that, um, you know, he doesn't really have any plans or agendas. Uh, he says what he wants to say. He wants to be the smartest and the toughest, the tallest, the handsomest uh, dude in the room. And at the end of the day, that's all really that matters to them. When you tell generals that you know more than them because you watched it on 
uh, the History Channel. I'm at that point. I don't know what to tell you, man. That's like me going to Billy Blanks and like, he yo, bro, you need to extend your legs more. You're doing that taco exercise wrong. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it's crazy. Uh, I can't. I can't with this world right now. 2020. Just, just remember, 2020. Kobe passed away. Rest in peace. To me, the nine the Niners lost the Super Bowl. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in 2020's category. Right. Coronavirus crept up, and then I read somewhere Kim Jong Un died and came back to life in 2020. That also happened. I don't know if you yes. followed that at all. Yes, clones. Well, they cloned Gucci Man, and they cloned. So they were bound to clone Kim Jong. You know what I mean? They they they've cloned all these other uh, rappers supposedly. So you don't think that a dictator won't get the clone treatment? I didn't even know about that cloning. That's some other other stuff. It's, right? it's the silliest shit ever. Like Gucci got out of jail and lost hella weight, and they're like, he's been cloned because now he's eating good. And uh, no, he did some jail time, and he realized that nah, this isn't for me anymore. Let me get my life right, and he got his teeth fixed. And so there you go. That's the cloning. We're so crazy, man. All right, man, I'm going to let you go. Yeah, um, man, but shout it, out to, just remember, uh, we got y'all. What's that? So you don't, you don't watch, you don't watch black shows, uh, D. This is a, this is, this is, this is a t-shirt from the show Insecure, which is a kind of a girl show, but it's also yes. really funny. You also don't watch Power. Everybody watches the show. Just know that D doesn't watch any of the real shows, bro. I don't but watch that's how Power. You Hold on, before you go, I don't, before you try to hit me with some old 94 tack, uh, drug bill type stuff, right? I don't watch Power because I watch The Wire. There's no reason to watch The Power if you watch The Wire. I don't now watch- you're that old man who's like, these kids these days and their shows. Yeah, I don't watch Insecure because I'm a dude. And it's just, I, I, Damn, shouts, came from shouts to Issa Rae. I just saw the stuff on Netflix with her and the Indian dude. It was funny. I watched it. I don't. I do. Wow. I, watch, I think you watch like two episodes of the show you would like it though. Even though it's a girl show, they watching, got some dudes in it. I am watching Black AF. And shout out to that's that. That's right, you told me about you that. Know, I, think that's, I think that's dope. But for me, when I do get to watch TV, I like to watch suspenseful, like criminal type stuff. And so, yeah. you know. Non-black shows. Hey. Deami Moraney does not care about black me. people. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no black shows. You know, and you hate Tupac. I'm putting it all out there, bro. I did not hate Tupac. <laughs> You're just mad because he's not on the wall behind me. Shout out to uh, Techno Chrome. But you have Big Pun. He has like one EP. He doesn't even have a whole album. But still, Impact. So this is the holy grail to me behind me. My favorite rappers. Above me, Big. Uh, to the is that is that is that uh, Kid from Kid and Play behind you? Oh, man. You know what? On that note, I'm going to just... That is Big Daddy. <laughs> and how dare you in the, your Issa Rae, we got y'all t-shirt. Don't ask me if that was Kid and Play. That is Big Daddy K. How dare you? But right above me, DJ Quick. And like you said, Big Pun, rest in peace. Uh, so those are my, that's my, those are my MCs. Those are the dudes that I rock with, uh, to me musically, uh, the dopest cats to do it, in my opinion. So, um, thank I don't you. Know how we ever did music together. I, I don't, I ask myself that every day, <laughs> brother. <laughs> but, but it was top music. It was dope. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But thank you for sitting down, man. I know you got a lot to do. Uh, keep fighting that good fight out there and, and being an inspiration, uh, you know, to, to all of us. There's so many kids that you know real quickly when you said that law was your plan b uh and music was your plan a man like i told you the other day i'm just proud of you we can't really discuss where you're going we'll get to that maybe later on but just to, to for me to know your past where you where you came from pasadena in i won't go into more of that to where you're at now and the trajectory man i'm just i'm really proud of you you know from the bottom of my heart the work that you put in um, and just the things that you've had to overcome, um, not just in the beginning, but throughout uh, your life, man. So um, I'm glad that you're out there teaching the children, okay. well, not the children, but, you know, young adults. And, uh, you know, hopefully I, I, if you ever need me to be involved at a lower level when it comes to, you know, working with the children, man, holler at your boy, man. Uh, but until then, uh, thank you for joining. Thank you, everybody, for uh, checking this out. We'll throw this on YouTube and we'll figure it out. It's our first ever Zoom uh, session or, or whatnot. Um, and, uh, hey man, again, appreciate you. And, uh, I'll talk with you soon, man. All right, man. All right, man. Love, man. Peace.